I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not, for many, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our gospel lesson is from the 17th chapter in John's gospel, the 20th through 26th verses. Listen now to God's word for us. Jesus prayed, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a couple reasons to celebrate this morning. The first is high and lofty, literally. This week, we celebrate in the church the Ascension of Christ. Now, actually, Ascension Day was Thursday, which uh, is 40 days after Easter, 10 days before Pentecost, which, if you remember that one, it's 50 days after Easter. Uh, but, of course, the day of Easter changes every year according to the cycles of the moon. So, yeah, these days are not easy to keep track of. But the purpose for it is. The day of ascension celebrates Christ leaving his disciples and being taken up into heaven. After his resurrection, he spent 40 days teaching and preaching, ministering among his followers, and at 40 days, that was all. He left. It's a high and lofty celebration. I can respect that. Now, uh, the other day we mark today is, of course, Mother's Day. It's, it's not a religious holiday, of course, but it's an important one in our families and in our culture. And I would argue it's kind of the opposite of the ascension. This one is, in part, and if we're honest, celebrating the down and dirty part of serving our families. Being a parent is not all sunshine and roses. I read this week some True confessions from moms, like, I just ate a pint full of Haagen-Dazs, 
And when my three-year-old asked me what I was eating, I told her it was special medicine for mommies, because I didn't want to share. <laughs> Or、uh, after failing to plan for her son's second birthday party, for which he was very excited, one mom simply told him he had the wrong day and his birthday wasn't until next week. <laughs> one woman admitted, "I haven't taught my kids to tell time, so I can say it's bedtime whenever I want." So a little honesty on a day that celebrates the ones who brought us up—it's a good thing, because too often parenting turns into a competition, rather than all of us realizing we're just one big team. We've been brought here with our varied histories, with good moms or not so good moms, and gather here to listen to the words of Jesus to his disciples. But in John's gospel, Jesus isn't talking to us. He's talking to God. Jesus is actually praying,、uh, not just for his disciples that are with him then, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. Jesus is praying to his Father for us. But does he tell us to do anything? What's he want his followers to do? We know this answer. Think of the Great Commission in Matthew. Jesus says, "Go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them." Because the scripture we read in Acts is Luke's description of the ascension. Jesus says to those with him, "You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem." In all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Those are important words, as you might expect. After all, if you knew you were leaving your friends, going away for good, that things would never be the same again, you probably would say something important. Something for them to remember. Charlie Chaplin's last words, who, when a priest said, "May the Lord have mercy on your soul," replied in true fashion, "Why not? It belongs to him anyway." The last words of Jesus. These are them. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, actually, mostly because in the midst of commands like "Love one another." Which is obviously important, but kind of non-specific. Well, I like concrete stuff sometimes, and so here he gives his disciples a checklist. That's something I can get behind. He tells them, "Go to Jerusalem." That one's not difficult, because the text locates the ascension on the Mount of Olives, which is walking distance from Jerusalem. Considering that Jesus and his disciples traveled all over that region pretty routinely, he's not asking a lot. Basically, Jesus is saying, "Be my witnesses in your neighborhood, you know, among the people that you know well." It's not hard. He tells them, "Go to Judea," which also isn't so bad. Judea is the region that they're in. It's where Jesus was baptized, where he raised Lazarus, where he appeared. After his resurrection, the disciples know Judea. They don't know everybody there, of course, but they have a reputation, and the people in Judea are a lot like them. So, by saying for the apostles to go to Judea, he's basically telling them, "Be my witnesses in Bay County, downtown, or by the lake, where you work." Where you go to school, be my witnesses to the people who are like you. Then it gets more difficult. Go to Samaria, Jesus says. You know Samaria. You've heard about it, the Good Samaritan, where Jesus uses an example of a kind and compassionate Samaritan, because people wouldn't expect a Samaritan to be kind or compassionate to them. It's the next region over from Judea. But the Samaritans don't have a good reputation. They're hostile to the Christians even before they knew what Christians were. 
It was dangerous. It was a dangerous area, too. One where travelers might get beaten and robbed and left for dead. But he says, go to Samaria. And he says, be my witnesses to people who aren't like you. People who probably won't like you. People you don't know and who don't care to know you. And bring my gospel to them. That's where it got harder. Here's a major challenge for the church, even now, right? To share the love of Jesus to people who might not want to hear it, people who aren't like us, maybe people who are nearby but who need the love of God desperately. Maybe this ministry in Samaria is, is to the homeless or the poor, to the ones we all see walking down the street and hope don't walk our way. We know that challenge, right? It's not easy. Because in part, maybe it's not easy because it won't bear fruit that we can see very often. Maybe we won't even get to plant a seed. I've heard folks describe Christian witness that way, of course. But I know enough to know you can't bear fruit. You can't plant a seed until somebody comes along and tills the soil. Maybe that's our job, just stirring things up a bit. So finally, Jesus says, be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. This means investing time and resources into mission programs uh, across the country, even foreign missions, of course, but it means something else. Be my witness to the ends of the earth means that no matter where we go, where we end up, we are charged with being Christ's ambassador. It's not something we can say doesn't apply in a certain situation. It's always incumbent upon us to be Christ's witness. We can't hide from that obligation, even if we go to the ends of the earth. No matter where you go, there you are. And Jesus has come along for the ride. So, okay, those were the final instructions. But why? Why are we going to all of these places? Why are we teaching? Why are we telling the good news to all people? This is where Jesus' prayer in John comes in. He says, so that they, that's us, all who come to believe, so that they might be completely one, that all who love the Lord would love one another, and that through our unity we would show forth a glimpse of the unity of Jesus and the Father, the unity found in God. So, all the stuff we've been reading these past few weeks, the entire farewell discourse, the last words of Jesus, Jesus' commands, his promises, his petitions, and now his prayers, all of it ends with a plea for Christian unity. It's honestly a little more difficult than it sounds, though, right? Because, listen, the things that divide us as Christians are important at some level. I mean, you and I feel comfortable in this place more than another place for some reason. And the diversity of church experience, the fact that there are a lot of different ways of being Christian, well, it helps us to be part of a community that values what we value, even amidst that diversity, it allows us to worship in an environment that builds up our faith and encourages our own discipleship. And we need to remember, of course, there is much more that unites us than divides us as Christians. But it just can't be that simple because we can't really pull it off. We never have. But, you know, well, we can admit, we can admit to this. We can admit we're not good at unity, even as churches. We're divided. We're not one. 
Planning something so simple as an ecumenical service is sometimes gymnastics and other times just a headache. And while it's sad, but it's true that congregations foolishly regard other congregations as the competition, passing judgment. Why we're better. Why a church that's shrinking or having a hard time isn't as squared away as us. We shake our heads that they don't hit the benchmarks and we breathe a sigh of relief for ourselves. Or, just as often, we see a church that is successful at reaching folks in the community and maybe we aren't. So we point out how we would do it differently where they've got it wrong, why their success isn't really as meaningful or as deep as ours could be. Look, I've done that. I've seen it done a thousand times. And all of it, of course, is presuming something we probably wouldn't want to say out loud, that we are the body of Christ. We're in. They're out. Or, if we're being gracious, and most of the time we are, we're meeting God's approval with an excellent work, folks. And they're coming in with a good effort. And look, we can extend this past the church, right? We can go ahead and admit that we do this all the time on an individual basis. We compare ourselves with other folks all the time, comparing ourselves. I don't even know who the Joneses are, but I'm pretty concerned about keeping up with them all the time. When we're at work, when we're at the gym, when we're in school, when we're at the checkout counter, There's a whole cottage industry called Pinterest and mommy blogs that almost functions as a giant scorecard for who is the most creative and together of the moms. But Christ calls us to unity. So how do we get past our failure? It's actually easy. If I tell you, you're going to have to help me out with something afterward. And if I tell you, you have to promise you'll practice it. Okay? Like anything, you get better with practice. It's super simple. Okay? Let's do what Jesus does. Pray for others. Pray for on their behalf. Think about your struggles and pray for others who might be in the same boat. Think about the ones that you think do it wrong and pray for them, not that they'll think like you, but that God would be glorified through them. Because the simple, honest truth is that it is nearly impossible to have a bad thought about, to feel superior toward, to consider somebody not worth a darn if it's someone you remember in prayer. Someone that you've asked God to glorify. So now I need some of you to come here. I need like eight of you. And I want Brian because he's tall. Come on up, seriously. I should make a circle. Some of you on the floor, and then others of you right around here. And Brian, you can be right there, down there in the middle. This should be good. All right. All right, so just make a circle. Everybody kind of spread out. Make, space yourselves out evenly. Some of you on the stairs here. You've got to make a whole circle. Come on this way. All right, there we go. Hey, uh, all right. Hey, look, we're good. We're good. Stop, stop. No, no, no. Brian, center. All right. Yes. Okay, the only way, uh, the way I want to do this is a visual aid. They're the only props that we have. 
Um, let's say that all of you are people, okay? And let's say, well, Brian's Jesus. Okay. We're all working our way toward Jesus. And everybody here, everybody in the circle has a different path, right? Your paths don't cross at all. Jesus is in the center, though, for you. Jesus is in the center of your faith and your life. Now, let's say Len wants to distance himself from his neighbors. What do you do? Where do you go? Can, can you go to the side? Well, no, you'll be closer to Heather than you are right now. What about that side? Now, you'd be closer to Joy. Even if you went forward, you'd end up closer to Janet than you are right now. So, <laughs> to distance yourself from your neighbor, you have to go back, right? So, take a step back. Keep going. It's the only way he can separate himself from the pack. So everybody, distance yourself from your neighbor. What happened? That's right. If you pull away from your neighbors, you are, by definition, moving away from Jesus. Everybody has the same goal right? Everybody wants to be there, to have a close relationship with Jesus. So move closer to Jesus, everybody. Draw closer. There you go. What happened? See? It's one of those abstract concepts that just got concrete. You get closer to Jesus you get closer to one another. And if you get closer to one another, you get closer to Jesus. And you do it together. And so pray. Pray with Jesus that we all could be one. Amen.